Well, hello, this is Scott Lankford. I'm a professor of English at Foothill College. I'm also part of the Global Educators Network in collaboration with Stanford Global Studies. And we're here welcoming a former Foothill student who recently completed her M. Bill, which means master's degree at Cambridge University. So she's gone on to wonderful things. Maria Azanova, she'll be talking about her own life story. So I, I kind of wanted to not take up a long time introducing Maria to you because it's quite a bit of our conversation. But Maria is uh, an indigenous culture conservation uh, leader in Southern Siberia in Russia and she will be showing you maps so you can figure out where that is. Uh, Maria, welcome back to Foothill College virtually from Ulan Ude in the, Bur in the Republic of Buracha in Russia. This is my virtual clap. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Scott. Amor uh, Mande. Uh, greetings, friends. Uh, thank you so, so much for um uh bringing me <laughs> to to your uh to the virtual um campus to the virtual meeting it is such a pleasure to be back even virtually um at, at my beloved Foothill college um i was uh, very honored to present uh a couple of months ago i believe it was october or was it november <laughs> that's right it was october yeah, it was oh, no, October. It was, what am I thinking? No, it was November, excuse me. It was November is Native yeah. American Heritage Month at Foothill College. It was November, yes. And I was able to present uh, during the uh, celebration of the Native um, American Heritage Month. And uh, and uh, uh, now it's, 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 it's such a great pleasure to able to share some of my experience um, with you. Uh, maybe some of you were at the top. Um, you know, last year, I'm not sure, um, but there are some updates um, to the project, so hopefully you'll find that interesting um, as well. Um, I think it'd be a good uh, um, uh, moment to, to start the slideshow. Okay, and then while Chris is getting the slides up, let me also mention, since you mentioned Native American Heritage Month at Foothill College, um, Maria is an indigenous leader, and, and I think one of the things that gets left out of many Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Months, and I'm really proud that we are inclusive, is in addition to all the nation state identities, Japan, China, Indonesia, et cetera, that go along with API heritage, there are dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens, probably really hundreds, of indigenous peoples all across Asia and the Pacific Island nations. And so, I am very proud of us for including indigenous leaders in our API Heritage Month. And it's a good moment also to mention that of course we have our own indigenous peoples in the Bay Area, the Ohlone tribe, which is still very much there, has been there for five, 10,000 years at least since the end of the last ice age. Dozens and dozens of indigenous peoples, First Nations peoples in California, literally hundreds of tribes across North America and then hundreds of tribes, hundreds of tribes and indigenous nations across Asia and around the world. So Maria is part of a global movement to bring indigenous wisdom and indigenous knowledge and, and indigenous conservation practices to the forefront. And I can't tell you how proud I am of you, Maria. I think that the work you're doing is some of the most important on the planet. Oh, and while I'm chattering away, I completely forgot to say happy Earth Day 50th anniversary. Tomorrow is the, we, the pun is birthday, be Earth, right? Um, it, it's the birthday of Earth Day. So it's birthday, it's happy 50th birthday to Earth Day. And that's another reason that I wanted Maria to be with us here today. Um, okay, so now that I've done my, my intro, Maria, why don't you go ahead and Tell the students and other participants here, um, my own classes here, English 1C Honors, um, and then we are joined by um, other members of the Foot Community students, faculty, staff as well, and then people will be watching the Zoom cast later asynchronously if they're not here now. So Maria, tell us a little bit about your journey. Oops, Chris, we went back to the other slideshow. Your journey from um, Briaccia to Foothill to Harvard to Cambridge 
And don't forget to tell Chris when you want him to advance the slides. He is the master of advance. Um, um, yeah, thank you, Scott. Um, yes, I would like to share, um, <laughs> as on one hand, as briefly as possible, because you know uh, we don't have a lot of time. But at the same time, I would like to um, focus on some um, aspects of of um, particular experiences. Um, as it probably could relate to the the topic of of this month's celebration. Um, so next next slide, please. Okay, so uh, to begin, I suppose I need to explain where I'm from. Uh, we see the big uh, world map um, and this big yellow country. Uh, you can see, and it says Russia. And uh, on the next slide, can, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, it's um, to, to, so you, you've memorized Russia, right? So, and here's again to the right is the, is the globe. Um, and it, if you zoom in, you can see this majestic looking lake, Lake Baikal. And I happen to be right <laughs> um, next to it. Um, my hometown is called Ulanade. And uh, to the left, you can see a picture of um, um, the, the uh, Buri people from the western side of, of, of Lake Baikal, um, uh, which are more, more uh, 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 closer to, to, to my tribe, um, which is Ehirit, Ehirit tribe of, of Buri people. Uh, Buri people, we are considered to be part of the larger Mongolian nation, right? So if you go to Mongolia, um, again, Mongolia, M M Mongols are a constellation of different tribes. Uh, you know, there's Halkha Mongols, um, uh, uh, Western M Mongols, uh, uh, and, 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 and so forth. And Buryat people, uh, we, we happen to be one of the Mongolians, like, subgroups. And then within our um, nation, or within our own group, we are divided by different tribes. Those tribes are divided into different clans or subclans, and so forth and so on. Uh, next slide, please. Oh! And we're going to talk <laughs> I more. So uh, sorry, I just have to say that those seals are the cutest things on the planet. Yes. So. And Lake Baikal, um, please keep in mind this, uh, not only because it's the largest uh, freshwater lake in the entire world, um, it is uh, the world's uh um basically it's the biggest fresh water reserve in the world containing almost 20 percent you know two zero twenty percent of the world's fresh water reserve so the the amount is is absolutely um staggering um it is the deepest lake in the world um it has um tons of endemic species, meaning the, the, this, this type of plants and animals where, where you cannot anywhere, where you cannot find anywhere in the world, which includes this little kitty, the, the freshwater seal. So, um, and it's, it's a true mystery, how did it get there? Um, and, and scientists suspect that it arrived through to Lake Baikal through, there was an opening somehow, uh, tens of thousands of years, or even millions, of course, millions of years, was connected to the ocean. And then, you know, that, 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 um, that road or that um, canal disappeared. And then it, it kind of just uh, uh, got stuck there and it's doing, doing just fine. Um, it's really cute. Um, but also Blake Bacal is the home for you know, thousands, you know, more than 2,000 um, endemic species of plants, um, um, animals, uh, and um, fishes. Yeah, and let me mention um, two things. Uh, first of all, endemic, if you don't know the word, endemic means that it, they, those species only exist at Lake Baikal, the Baikal seal being a great example of that, and the world's only freshwater seal. It's also, uh, Maria mentioned, it's the largest lake on earth. There's as much water in there as, as, there, as in all of the Great Lakes in North America combined. 
Um, it's the old, it's the, it's, it's, it's the largest, deepest and oldest lake on the planet. And so it is the mother, it is the mother lake. I mean, this, yeah. and this is also the, the place that the Buryat people come from. This is their homeland, yes. the heart, the very beating heart of their homeland. That is all true. Uh, the, the, the lake, Lake Baikal is, is, um, is considered sacred. Um, it's alive and sacred to, to my people. Um, we perform um, ceremonies in, either at the shores of Lake Baikal, or if not, um, we address, you know, uh, Lake Baikal and its um, uh, divine forces in our prayers. Um, just a little bit of statistics. It's 30 million uh, years old. Again, the oldest uh, lake in the world. The length is 395 miles. Uh, the width is 49 miles. And the depth, the very famous uh, um, depth is uh, 5,387 feet. So imagine um, how, how deep it is. And, and uh, more than maybe, a mile. That's more than a mile deep. Yeah, more than a mile About deep. About 400 miles long. Mm -hmm. and, the, <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the Buryat, and the Buryat uh, name for Lake Baikal is Baikal Dale, which means uh, ocean Baikal, because we don't see it as the lake, we see it as an, as an ocean, um, uh, something so vast and so uh, uh, tremendous, right, in, in, in the in both of, of size and of, of environmental significance and cultural significance, it's truly um, an ocean. Uh, next slide, please. Now, um, I would like to talk about my uh, Foothill College journey. I was enrolled as a, a full-time student since 2009 up to 2011. And I just, uh, I mean, if it wasn't for Foothill College, um, uh, I, I just don't think a lot of um, my other educational journeys or professional journeys would even happen um, at the first place. Um, next slide, please. And I just want to say how all, you know, all of us are so lucky to, to be a part of, uh, of, of um, a school so special, right? Um, it's, it's not only the place where just to transfer out somewhere, but it's, it's, it's I don't know, it became even uh, something uh, more than a home um, for me. Now, I was very, very active on campus. Um, I was uh, part of the Pass the Torch program. Um, when I first came, I was not doing well uh, at all, especially in math. And, um, but luckily, um, I had a fantastic Pass the Torch tutor, LED Yao, who became a good friends and um, who, who helped me out tremendously in terms of um, uh, understanding math and also um, just some uh, uh, other um, things. And next slide, please. Mm -hmm. I was also part of the Honors Institute. Um, I was able to present at the Honors Research Symposium at uh, UC Berkeley in, wow, 10 years ago. Can you imagine, Scott, 10 years ago? Um, and uh, where I was able to present on, on the Nick Adams stories by Ernest Hemingway, and I presented on the a theme, a recurring theme of water in this particular um, um, book. Um, it was a fantastic experience and it taught me uh, obviously presentation skills, um, analytical skills, and how to really uh, read between the lines, literally, because if you read the Nick Adams stories, it's not necessarily you would um, notice that, you know, there's a lot of water patterns there and how does it relate to um, the story of Nick Adams, you know, his formation as, as, a, as, as a human being, really, and how man-made water affects him or how nature-made water affects him. So that was absolutely a um, wonderful uh, way to, for me to uh, explore that. Uh, next one. Yeah, and let me mention, Maria, I mean, you know already, um, if you're joining us as guests, uh, my English 1C honors class is kind of the base audience for some of these events in API Heritage Month. And Maria being one of two honors students that's presenting for API Heritage Month. Um, next week, our guest, will have a guest, uh, Viola Lasmana, who's currently a postdoctoral fellow at USC, and she's 
teaching and doing research in new media. So Maria and Viola are fabulous, fairly recent Foothill graduates who have gone on to truly spectacular careers as leaders, as academics, and, um, and we're so proud of them. So I'm just breaking in for a little advertisement for the Honors Program, the Honors Institute at Foothill College. Uh, do you want a laser pointer by any chance? Um, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not yeah, sure. don't worry about that, Chris. It's okay. okay. We'll, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, it's okay. So, anyways, uh, kind of back to the um, um, to the foothill days. Um, I was also very actively involved in volunteering with Circle K International uh, because when I first came to California, um, you know, I always knew that it, it would be so important to uh, say thank you to the community that welcomed me, right, to the, the area um, uh, community. Uh, so, and it was just wonderful to make new friends, to experience volunteering as it is in America. Um, and next, please. Um, yeah, and also I was very active as a, as part of uh, associates associate students of Foothill College, the student government. Um, um, next, <laughs> and uh, I'm pretty sure uh, that that um, that they they're doing the good work that they that they have um, today as well. Um, now um, I was probably crazy enough to perform at the International Students' Night, the very um, first year of, of my, um, um, I think it was the like second quarter at, at, at Foothill College. I just thought it would be very important to represent my culture uh, and to, um, um, at the, for the audience who probably would never know, you know, where Buryatia is, or that Russia does have indigenous people and uh, that look like me. So um, it was a wonderful way to have that type of representation. Um, next, please. And uh, what Foothill College, the, you know, the biggest outcome, not just, you know, the truly world-class education, uh, but also the incredible friendships that I that I gained uh, with uh, two, with specifically two of my uh, classmates, um, Milora Sobode and Amrina Rusiada from Indonesia. Um, so it's it's this this type of friendship and uh, remained uh, with me uh, throughout uh, this this years. And last December, I uh, uh, visited uh, Amrina's uh, wedding in India. So that that's how far that friendship uh, took took me. Next, please. So um, <clears throat> after uh, completing my associates um, in anthropology at Foothill College, I transferred to Harvard University Extension School. Now, not a lot of people know that, uh, you know, maybe a lot of people know that Harvard is a constellation of 13 different schools. You know, we have Harvard College, um, you know, business school, um, medical school, Kennedy School of Government, and the list goes on and on. Uh, however, only two um, schools at Harvard, such as Harvard College and Harvard Extension School, they offer bachelor degrees. Other schools, um, they offer professional, you know, masters and PhDs and so forth, but only two schools offer um, bachelor degrees. So, I learned about this program and I decided to, to give it a try um, inter and um, it took me a little bit more, just got to be honest with you, than I initially expected. But the very good thing about this and again praising Foothill, I cannot praise Foothill enough, but um, all of the classes that I took um, that, would be, that would be transferred to potential TUC because I wanted to actually attend to UCLA, um, all of those classes were transferred to um, Harvard, um, which means that, that that means uh, all of the classes are legit and, um, you know, and are welcomed um, to be considered as, you know, as, as basically the first two years of your um, undergrad education. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll 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 break in just to, to brag a little bit more that in, on the list on the I mean I've been teaching thirty years at Foothill College but on the list there's several 
we have several people, there's several former Foothill students teaching writing at Harvard now. So not only do our classes transfer to Harvard, our students transfer to Harvard, and in some cases, our instructors and professors transfer to Harvard. So Maria is, Maria is not alone, although quite distinguished in having found this, and having found her way in that direction. So congrats again on that, Maria. Keep going now. You can, I just wanted to, I have to put in my, I have to put in my yay foothill on top of your Absolutely. Area. No, we need to do it as, as, as much as we can. And again, it's, it's <laughs> so um, fast forward up, in, up till 2016, I, I graduated. I was able to bring uh, some of my family to this uh, graduation. You can see that I'm wearing a traditional Buryat um, dress. <laughs> um, so Which it was wonderful. Which is conveniently crimson, I might add, since that's... Yeah. Harvard's color is crimson. <laughs> I actually thought about that. That's right. Yeah, like, I never thought about how it either. Convenient. <laughs> how convenient indeed. Um, um, and a little bit more about the, the, the program from where I graduated. Um, so majority of the classes I was able to take online. Um, you know, and this is very interesting because um, I mean, um, back at the day there, there was some class i mean there was a lot of challenges from technical challenges the internet was not always reliable um then there were um um uh, probably the biggest challenge was time difference i mean it, it's one o'clock right now here in Ilana day right but with boston <laughs> we we have 12 hour difference sometimes it's 13 hour difference depending whether it's winter or summer you know daylight savings time so it fluctuates but nevertheless it's it's, it's a really big chunk right uh, um, of the time difference and i would have classes that would start really really early and then um um so there's a lot of sacrifice was was, was was done but at the same time i was able to you know um along with um completing my education there i was also was able to put my organization um kind of on, on track uh, work on many different projects and you know take care of my grandma who you also see in the picture um but without this aspect of online education you know um i don't think you know career-wise uh, i would be way way behind because by the time i graduated i was already able to register my organization as an official non-government non organization uh, which is quite challenging to do in 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 russia it's very time consuming so um that alone i, I suppose it's it's it was it was worth doing you know education um majority of it distance wise but then i would come for example for summer school or semester on campus where when when i needed the kind of on campus um person to person um experience so um it's really interesting just because here we are stuck in the covid quarantine yes yes, uh, yes and so absolutely. it's nice it's nice to know that that the online aspect of your education had its upsides i think we're all sort of learning that uh, this is an upside for me is that if you've joined us after the introduction maria is is joining us live from Ulanude in southern Siberia, in Russia, in the Republic of Buryatia. Uh, so it's one o'clock in the morning there. <laughs> Thank you for staying up late, Maria, although I kind of know you, sometimes you do that anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, it is exciting and it's interesting to know that you had faced the same challenges that the students are facing right now. I mean, many of, many of our students at Foothill have done lots of online education but of course many of us have not so it's great to it's great to hear that you figured out how to do that and got yourself through harvard extension classes mm -hmm. all the way from the other side of the planet with occasional visits to cambridge uh in massachusetts right yeah. so it can be yeah, it can right. be done and at, and also here we are with the second international guest that we have for our asian pacific islander heritage month last week uh, we were joined by Sandeep Roy from Kolkata. So now we have, so now we, so this, today we're in Russia, uh, we were in India last week and we'll keep traveling the world as we go. Yeah, and that's, you know, the, the both, um, it's, it's, it's the beauty and the challenge of, of 
of what is happening today. Um, but I also need to uh, kind of give um, um, a round of applause perhaps to Harvard Extension School because they were kind of pioneers at, at Harvard of, of the online distance education. And when entire Harvard College was sent home um, back in March, um, um, because of the, you know, of, of quarantine, it was the folks from Harvard Extension who helped to set up this new online uh, learning platform um, to transition. So I think they transitioned as, as I think, as relatively easy in, in comparison to um, a lot of institutions. Uh, and it has to do with the, um, with this, uh, with the developed system, both, you know, technology-wise and um 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 <laughs> to so so you know very much like foothill i might add yeah. foothill also has one of the largest online education programs in yes. the united states which means in the world so we're good at it too not that Absolutely. we haven't had our glitches but here we are demonstrating our skills with our former student Maria Azanova. So I'm glad that Harvard Extension is catching up with Foothill. I'm gonna- Absolutely, no, 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 Harvard. seriously. <laughs> seriously, yes. Absolutely. I'm glad yeah. they're catching up with us in Silicon Valley. Yep. All right. Uh, ne next one, next, next slide, please. Oh! So Scott <laughs> visited Lake Vital in 2015 and it was absolutely wonderful to uh, to be able to translate um, and be a personal tour guide um, in my homeland, and to, to uh, so it was absolutely wonderful um, <laughs> experience. So you know, and that again applies to that foothill for me. For me, at least, it just it just doesn't end when you graduate. No, it, it's the opposite. It expands. <laughs> the influence of it it expands after you graduate. Uh, next one. Yeah, well, even before you switch that slide, Chris, um, let me just say that um, I'm going to put a little advertisement in here for you, Maria. But one of the ways that Maria um, supports herself in Russia is to be a professional translator and, and tour guide. And she's fully 100% fluent in three languages. Um, so she's completely fluent in Russian. She's, as you see, completely fluent in English. And she's also completely fluent in the Buryat language, which is uh, one of the dialects of the wider Mongolian languages. So she's going to, if you ever want to go to Lake Baikal, there is no better guide translator. And it, it transformed my experience. It was a little bit, I mean, an analogy would be going to visit the Navajo Nation in, in New Mexico Arizona and Utah and being with someone who spoke English and Navajo uh, fluently as well as whatever language, you know, like Spanish, English. Yeah. So if someone that spoke Spanish, English and Navajo fluently, you don't see the place the same way when you have that kind of cultural and linguistic access. So I, I cannot tell you how much I owe to you in terms of what I saw and like by call. And um, it's one of the reasons that I'm so excited to have you back at Foothill College because it's a unique, your indigenous knowledge and your knowledge of, of that region is really unmatched. So that was a little advertisement just in case you suddenly get the itch ever to go to see the Mother Lake, the oldest, largest, deepest, wisest lake in the world. Maria would be happy to have, be your guide. Yeah, yep, yep, absolutely. So, you know, once this, so. Uh, pandemic is over and the borders are opened again i mean please uh, if you can <laughs> come 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 and visit us and be delighted to to, to have all of you um uh, at lake lake hall um next slide please did you ever get to rub john harvard's foot while you were at harvard um it's it's really advisable not to because you know <laughs> people do <laughs> Especially now. <laughs> and, and yeah. <laughs> oh, it's just it's something that you should not do. I do not yep. do that. <laughs> <laughs> it grows that that statue. <laughs> so um anyways, um I'm kind of shifting uh, to more of a professional, um kind of wearing my professional uh hat. Um I work work at um, at the non-government organization called Baikal Buryat Center for Indigenous Cultures. 
and on the left are, are my, my, my teammates, my co-workers, and frankly, one of them is my uncle <laughs> and his best friend, <laughs> so we formed this team. Um, and uh, they're total goofballs, as you can see. Um, and then uh, to the right, uh, we have we presented that the UN's um, Indigenous Peoples Forum a couple of years ago, and it has. And the presentation was on the one of the projects that I will talk about um, in a few minutes. Um, it's it's um, um, what what I can say about this. Um, we do a lot of things. Um, if you describe it in two sentences, it's, it's conservation of biocultural diversity. And when um, in indigenous world, in a lot of indigenous worldviews, and especially in Buryat worldview, nature, culture, and human, we are one, and we're interlocked in the golden interweave called Altan Hohi. So therefore, when you conserve culture, right, traditional indigenous culture, you also um, influence um, cons conservation of nature, of environment, of wildlife, um, of, of landscape, um, and, uh, and therefore yourself, right? Yourself as a person. Um, so that's, that's uh, in very, very briefly describes the mission, the idea be behind our organization. Um, next slide, please. And I'll, I'll add another little footnote while we're switching slides, Maria, which is, as you know, when the United Nations was formed, it did not recognize indigenous nations at all. It only recognized nation states. And it took almost 30, it took 30 years of activism by indigenous peoples across around the world to finally be recognized um, with, in the human rights documents even that the UN uh, that the UN publishes so that the rights of indigenous peoples have only recently been formally acknowledged and a kind of semi seat at the table for indigenous nations has finally been created so the fact that you were able to present at the United Nations <laughs> so proud of you coming from foothill to present at the United Nations right but that was, the, that was the result of literally decades and decades of very difficult negotiations and a lot of pushback, especially from <clears throat> the United States, Britain, France, and similar formerly colonial, oppressive, hegemonic nations. So it's a real achievement that for all for all indigenous peoples that you and others were able to present at the UN. All right, that's another commercial, but it's my job as the professor. Yes, I, I agree again with everything that, that's, that Scott says. And um, I mean, <laughs> it's just my, my, so kind of a prehistory to history, right? I was born into a family of indigenous activists. So both of my parents, they've um, been activists ever since I can remember fighting for Buryat uh, cultural um, and en environmental rights. So I suppose I inherited the conservation gene um, from, from them. And as my mother, you know, says that um, when you look at the UN declaration on indigenous people. I mean, it, it's a tiny document, right? It's, it's, it's so small, but every single letter, like every single column of period is, is written in blood, basically in blood of indigenous people. So, which means like the, when we, we, we're talking about hundreds um, of years of, you know, colonization, of, of murder, of, of repression, oppression, of genocide, um, and yet, all of this sacrifice and and you know the battle is is not over yet. The battle is just it's, it's, it's only beginning uh, for indigenous people worldwide, uh, and it's about um, re reclaiming with your ancestral lands, your sacred sites, your cultural um, maybe artifacts, uh, your uh, natural territories, so you can leave the way your ancestors did. Um, so, you know, the battle is ongoing uh, worldwide. Um, and I feel like that's why 
I, you know, I'm part of the organization that that is basically um, that that fights the battle too. Uh, as as I don't think I have any other choice. Um, I mean, there are obviously lots of choices, but it it seems that um, this type of work that I'm doing, and I'm going to talk more about the projects. Um, it's 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 quite important. Probably the, one of the most um, again. Having said that everything's interconnected, um, it's important to start with um, intergenerational uh, transfer uh, of indigenous knowledge, because if you can't transfer that uh, knowledge and your traditions, then, you know, that's, that's it. You're going to die as, as, as a culture and as a nation, really. Um, so one of our um, projects that we're really proud of, and it's really fun, uh, it's it's nomadic school of creativity, um, and uh, it's a summer camp um, and sometimes winter camps too, uh, for urban children, uh, mostly urban indigenous children, uh, who don't have access to um, to traditional knowledge to 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 express traditionally culture, um, uh, to word cultures. Um, uh, sorry, losing my track of thought. But anyways, on the picture, you can see the, the, the children and they're being exposed to, first of all, they're being exposed to nature. Second of all, they've learned how to construct the yurt. And you can see the yurt is the traditional uh, house of Buryat people. Yes, that's right. And, um, and they're sitting inside listening to elders, um, the, the, the story of elders. Um, and during this, this particular camp, the idea was that uh, for two days they've been um, the children were in Buryatia in the in the set nomadic camp and then um, for the rest of the camp five for five days we brought them to Mongolia uh, where they also continued to be um, exposed to to uh, both natural and cultural um, heritage uh, can we please get to the to that slide. Yes, uh, you can see that they're learning how to paint nature in traditional um, um, Mongolian style. And, and on to the, to the right, uh, they, 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 they had a master class with a Mongolian um, musician and throat singer. Um, so, and which, which was a lot of fun. Um, and we continue to do Kind of smaller scale workshops in in schools. Um, of course, now it's it's every it's, it's it's postponed, and a lot of our projects are a little you know um, they're postponed because of the uh, quarantine. Um, but hopefully, we'll get back on track um, as soon as possible. Um, next one, please. Um, kind of continuing um, the intergenerational transfer trend. Oh, yeah. Um, the very recent project um, uh, back in January, we were able to bring um, Mongolian children and, and Mongolian indigenous children. Um, and you can see on the map where Mongolia is. We, we border Mongolia, but, but again, both countries are quite large. So the kids on the, um, on, on the left, we brought the delegation from western part of Mongolia and eastern part of Mongolia. So for those kids just to reach the capital, Ulaanbaatar, it's probably a couple of days uh, worth of um, travel on a vehicle. And then from Ulaanbaatar to Ulaanbaatar, it's also, uh, it was a 12 hour ride, train ride. It was quite a journey just to get to, um, to our republic. So we brought them to, um, um, to a, it's called, it was called the uh, Digital Camp Project uh, in Kijanga village. And again, we connected the, um, these children with uh, local um, rural children as, as uh, um, on, on the basis of the camp that their um, uh, school established. Uh, and it's been a very, very um, positive um, and frankly incredible experience. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, Chris, before you switch that slide, um, leave it there just a second. If you're just joining us, um, some people come in late. I always kind of have my reintroduction. So Maria Zanova, former Foothills student, 
went then from there to Harvard, and then, well, as we'll find out soon, Cambridge. But if you want to know where she's speaking from, if you look at the map of Mongolia, which is so nicely clear for us, just north of Mongolia, you'll see the very gigantic Lake Baikal, the largest, oldest, deepest lake in the world, 400 miles long. And uh, she's speaking from the city of Ulanade, which is basically between the southern tip of Lake Baikal and Mongolia. So that, that is where we are joined today for Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month at Foothill College. And now you can go on to the next slide while I did my little, uh, my little orientation. It took me a long time um, as somebody who visited uh, Lake Baikal to find it. Like I have to admit that I, you, you have to kind of practice finding it on a map because Asia is vast. And even a lake as large as Lake Baikal, it can be hard to find. So if you're looking again, be sure to look for Mongolia first, then look north of Mongolia, and then you'll see Lake Baikal. And that's where Maria joins us from today. Okay, Maria, go ahead. Yes, um, one of the most remarkable things um, about this uh, exchange um, was, was the fact that, okay, so the students from the Western part of Mongolia, um, uh, they came from this school that, that you can see on the picture. Uh, it's obviously it's a rural school and it's, they, they're surrounded by majestic Altai mountains. Um, and um, in the center we have, um, <laughs> um, so be, <laughs> in the center we have uh, one of the participants of, of, of the camp and these children, um, they created this initiative of, again, Having said that everything's interconnected, a lot of things are interconnected in our in my work as well. Um, so I will talk about this in, a little bit later. But um, uh, my organization, we're, we we are part of the larger network called Land of Snow Leopard Network, and Snow Leopard is considered to be um, one of the uh, totemic or sacred animals for a lot of um, indigenous communities in Central Asia. Uh, be, um, because if you think about it, Mongolia is, you know, part of Central Asia, Buryatia, and um, there's a territory west of Buryatia called Republic of Altai. We you kind of look at this as like, yeah, it's, you know, kind of, um, you know, in, in terms of um, territory, it'd be probably appropriate to put it in the Central Asia um, geography. So nevertheless, we are a constellation of five countries, um, Mongolia, um, Russia, my, my, my region, Republic of Buryatia and Republic of Altai in Russia, as well as um, um, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. And um, we are a network of more than 100 uh, individuals um, who, yeah, thank you. And you can see on the map, you know, there's Kyrgyzstan, that is below Kazakhstan, and next to Kyrgyzstan will be Tajikistan, um, and then we have Mongolia and uh, Russia. Um, so all of these countries are um, um, are places of, of snow leopard habitat, and uh, we are gathered to uh, to create a new form of conservation of snow leopard and its ecosystem and its habitat through the revival of traditional indigenous knowledge. Um, uh, and we're, sci uh, there, it's a network of scientists, researchers, non-government organizations, uh, conservation organizations, educators, uh, schools, um, um, you know, the list goes on and on, and uh, which is led by cultural practitioners or shamans or spiritual leaders. Um, ne next, next slide, please. Now, one of the, our partners, uh, they created this initiative um, um, in, in Western Mongolia um, the, with, with the school children to create a play uh, which says, in search of the baby snow leopard. And you can see that uh, the school children, um, um, you know, they, 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 they wrote the script, uh, pr produced the play, and it was really successful. So they traveled all the way through the Western Mongolia with the um, with display to different schools, it was a huge success. It was um, uh, it's not just a play, but also an awareness of the of the endangered um, snow leopard and the ecosystems and the importance of conservation of this uh, sacred animal. 
So uh, my point is that um, we're very lucky to have um, most of the kids who were involved in this play to come to Briatia to, to this exchange. Um, next one. And my organization, right, um, PPCAC, we were able to present um, an interactive seminar <clears throat> with both Mongolian children that we brought and local uh, rural um, uh, children um, on, and we just posed a question, what would be, um, what, what did Earth look like 100 years ago, right, in 1920? What does Earth look like now in 2020? And how Earth is going to look like 100 years from now? Um, so it was wonderful discussion, um, uh, and it's just, uh, just, just, just <laughs> the, 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 the ideas and the minds of, of, of these children, of indigenous children. Uh, um, they were just. Um, I, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know how to describe this because it was such a powerful um, experience, and it shows that uh, children are aware of of the massive changes. Um, of the massive changes that is happening throughout the, the, the planet. And, you know, it is, I, I get this, I, I'm convinced that uh, children are not given enough credit. Uh, uh, and um, if you communicate with them, like you would communicate with adults or um, anyone else um, and ask their opinion and have them to be part of the solution, you know, that's, that's, that's where we're gonna see um, changes. Perhaps one of the most, there were a lot of profound moments uh, in, in this particular um, uh, exchange, but there were two. So on the right, we have an elder. Um, he is the geneticist, uh, he's the scientist, uh, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit uh, later about him. Um, but um, um, but he was discussing the importance of of preserving traditional um, buried heritage, uh, traditional uh, buried pastoralist practice. So my people were we were traditionally past uh, nomadic pastoralists, meaning we would travel from one place to another place uh, with animals, cattle. We had goats, sheep, cows, horses, and camels. Um, so. And all of the, these animals were always part of the ecosystem and using traditional pastoral uh, management, it you know, the, the, the people were aware to not to degrade earth, but rather be you know, part of the landscape. So, you know, you, just, you never exhaust the soil, right? And then the, the animals, because they've been part of the ecosystem would, would, all, would benefit um, the said ecosystem. And, and so forth. So, um, so, and it was very powerful to have this um, this elder, you know, who also happens to be a scientist, to to speak in Buryat language. And Buryat language is uh, is endangered. Uh, it is estimated uh, by UNESCO that it will disappear by 2050. So, like in less than 20 years, it will be completely gone. But you know, nevertheless, he was speaking Buryat, and because Buryat and Mongolian languages are quite similar, uh, Mongolian children could understand it as well. So it was absolutely um, incredible. And Maria, um, let me uh, let me let me just break in again to say that um, we're here for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day tomorrow. And where is this conversation in American education? Who is asking you what was the planet like in 1920? What is the planet like now? What will the planet be like in 2020? And I'm, I hope that you've been asked that in your own education here in, in the United States, since that's where most of you are joining us. But I'm sad to say, I don't think this conversation comes up nearly enough. And it's very inspiring that Maria is engaging elders and scientists and youth in their own indigenous language to ask this question, but where is that question in our own culture? And it needs to be there. And then I'm also gonna take this opportunity to remind us that uh, Maria is speaking to us from Ulan Ude, at where it is presently 23 degrees. Oh, I don't know if this is gonna work for us. 
But where, Maria, I was shocked to see that later this week, it's going to be 78 degrees. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Jumps up and down. Yeah, it's crazy, <laughs> right? Like this is in Siberia and it's April. So the, the climate impacts um, that are endangering Lake Baikal and endangering all of Buryatia are magnified in northern regions, as we know. And so um, this is an urgent, urgent question that Maria is asking these children. And we need to ask ourselves, especially on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. All right, that was my little Earth Day commercial. Mm -hmm. Happy birthday, Earth Day. Happy birthday, Earth Day, <laughs> which is every day. <laughs> That's um, right. Yeah. Um, and uh, so coming to the second kind of profound uh, message of, of, of this particular uh, project is one of the girls uh, from Mongolia, um, who is probably the most connected person to nature <laughs> out of all of this combined she said really profound i think she said um up until now you know up until this um ex uh, camp uh, th this this exchange uh all i did i i woke up i ate i went to school you know i played with friends and and then that's it and she she said that she um she feels so egoistical for not taking care of nature and I was just so shocked. It's like, you're the most connected person to the nature. You live directly right next to snow leopards, right? <laughs> and yet you feel this way that you're so, that you need to contribute more. So it's just, um, it was absolutely, um, um, you know, astonishing. Um, and, and at the same time, very sweet of her to, 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 to share these deep feelings um, and concern for the environment. So the, the purpose of the, uh, the reason I'm saying this is that, um, as I said, children are more aware uh, than we give them credit for, and that we should engage them more in our conservation efforts. Uh, and there's no such thing as a small conservation effort. All, all of this, uh, it contributes to the larger, um, um, larger uh, thing, right? Larger perspective. So next one. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the very big project that my um, organization is undertaking, and it's the revival and reintroduction of Aboriginal breed cow. As mentioned previously, uh, my people were traditionally uh, nomadic pastoralists. We were traveling with our animals from place to place, and it was very, um, you know, um, not, for, you know, just like wandering, but we had a purpose and we knew which season would be appropriate for a particular place or, and, uh, and how to use um, 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 natural resources um, wisely never take anything more than you can um, than you should and in this um, culture uh, we we tremendous importance was given to the cow because it gives our, us milk and and uh, meat so kind of long story short but um, um, being part of Russia since you know late 1600s we were colonized uh, and annexed by the Russian Empire. And then when the Russian Empire collapsed uh, in 1917 um, up till 1991, uh, we, Buryatia, uh, we've been part of the Soviet Union. Now, Soviet Union uh, brought their own definition of progress and, and, uh, and, the, and how things should, should run because they did not have any much um, reverence or regards to nature um, and human <laughs> and indigenous peoples. Um, so nevertheless, the Soviets, they, they completely wiped out the, our Aboriginal cow. They brought a, a, a European breed, breed of cow, you know, the ones that, that everybody's hating on right now <laughs> that contributes to, to, so, to, to that so-called contributing to climate change and such. But the thing is, with our cow, with worried cow, it was always part of the landscape. Um, it does not require a lot of resources. It's just, it, 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 it grazes freely. It finds its own food. 
and then um, you know then it the the, the drop <laughs> you know it's droppings it's it's it fertilizes the earth you know and the benefits are enormous and the cow it does not require to to be you know um, you know any outside you know antibiotics or uh, it does not require um, much of energy because it, it can just basically be outside even in the toughest winters so it's perfectly adaptable to to the very harsh climate um, that we always had um, so um, it was thought to be completely extinct in in Russia but luckily uh, that elder that I talked about who um, he found uh, he's a geneticist he's a scientist and he found them in uh, Mongolia because uh, during the Soviet persecution uh, several buried families were able to uh, escape um, the persecution and they run um, escaped to Mongolia with those animals and that's um, and and where they settled um, it was next to a very big lake, uh, Lake Hopsigul, and on the other side was this uh, high mountains. So that's how the the um, the, the, the breed's um, purity was intact for um, a lot of uh, many years. Um, kind of long story short, um, he was able to bring about a hundred animals, 100 cows back to Buryatia in 2015. And that's where my organization stepped in. We helped to organize and um, um, the DNA analysis, DNA analysis for each cow, <clears throat> which was performed by um, a, a genetic institute in Moscow. So now we have a clear picture of which cow is related to whom. And now we are able to breed them accordingly. So it's not, um, um, it's, so let's say one bull is not related to five cows. Therefore, they're, 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 they've been formed into a group. And um, this really kind of meticulous and, and uh, work was done last year. Yes, yes, thank you. No, 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 go, go back to the baby cow. Uh, next slide, please. Um, um, we, you, you see now that the, their uh, baby cows, we just, uh, <laughs> so the baby cows are born this year according to the table that I'm, um, that I'm holding um, on, on the uh, top right. Um, so, and, and this means that right now we have about 400 heads of, you know, coming from 100 to 400. It's, it's a pretty good result. And the idea behind this project is that not only the cow as a species will be revived, it's going to revive um, traditional herder, herding practices. A lot of people, a lot of weird people express interest into uh, returning to the traditional way of life, but it's very difficult to do so without the original animals. And that's where we are. We, we're bringing those original animals back. And then while we have the population reaches at least 3,000 uh, or at least 1,000 females, um, that's when we're going to redistribute the cows to those who are interested. And then we'll have the, um, the, the, the network uh, growing. And then next one. Yeah. And and, and those cows are really, really cute. They're like really fluffy. They're, they're smaller than your average cow, but it's just, they're really smart. Um, <clears throat> so I just can go on and on and on about the yeah. benefits of this special animal. I want to underline again, a, a sort of Earth Day message and uh, core to the mission of what Maria is trying to accomplish as an international indigenous culture and wisdom leader is that the, the Buryat people, as she mentioned, I mean, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years long before the Russian, uh, the Russian colonizers arrived in the late 1600s, they practiced these nomadic, these nomadic herding, uh, these nomadic herding methods, and the land thrived, and it was fully sustainable, and, and the culture was sustainable, the ecosystem was sustainable, and so they have an indigenous knowledge base of how to make these lands thrive again. They have the rescue package. They have, they have the knowledge that we need. They've always had the knowledge that we need. 
It's really a matter of listening to them. And since my class will be reading a book called The Sixth Extinction next in May, mm -hmm. this is one of the rare and beautiful instances, I wish it was not so rare, in which an animal which was thought to be extinct was discovered to be still, still existing and can be reintroduced and with tremendous healing power for a very large region of the planet. As the Buryat lands, as Maria has mentioned, extend across five different current nation states. So this is a tremendous, this contribution is a tremendous contribution to healing the planet and a great sort of little birthday, birthday message. So thanks for that, Maria. Thank you, Scott. Maria, I have a quick question though. In all the real work that you're doing, are a lot of these communities that are developing, are they talking about in terms of can they be environmentally conscious at the same time as being economically successful? Has those discussions, have you ever faced those oppositions or those discussions that they're saying, well, we rather make the maximum amount of profit and screw the environment? Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Is it in regards to the cow project specifically or for something else? Um, just, just in general, just like some, because you've, I mean, obviously you've spent a lot of time in terms of being environmentally conscious and conscientious. Mm -hmm. Have these communities that you've worked with, have they said, well, we don't, we don't really care about being environmentally conscious. We want to have profits and be economically uh, stable and, you know, maximize the profit at the cost of the environment in a sense. Oh, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, um, I mean, again, um, after the Soviet Union collapsed, it's the economic situation in, in not just in Buryati, but not just in Russia, but in all former Soviet states, it's been very, very difficult. And of course, you know, in, in um, um, you know, people would choose to put food on the table for their children rather than kind of thinking of, of um, of such of something long term of, of like conserving environment when you don't have anything to eat, right? Um, but a very interesting thing is going to happen that I'm going to talk about right now, and we can see a change of people's attitudes um, um, in the through the Lander Snow Leopard Network uh, program. Um, um, so again, this 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 is a network of five countries, right? Uh, two places in Russia, my region, and Republic of Altai, Mongolia, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. Now, what happened is that as a network, we've been active for, you know, let's say a little under 10 years, maybe like seven years. But through the seven years, um, the emphasis on conservation of snow leopard and its ecosystem was as such that the traditional knowledge, you know, legends, um, uh, cultural beliefs uh, that esteems, that uh, reveres uh, snow leopard as sacred. You know, therefore it cannot be hunted. Uh, its ecosystem must not be bothered. Um, it has, the snow leopard must have the, the sustainable like food chain. You know, you cannot hunt, over hunt its prey such as uh, mountain goats or mountain uh, sheep, etc. But the wildlife, human conflict exists. So, but um, in, in large, th thankfully to the efforts from our Tajikistan partner, um, where you can see on, um, uh, he's a journalist and he's the um, um, head of a cultural and um, non-government organization in Pamir Mountains. Um, he's been doing a lot of um, cultural outreach, uh, awareness programs, such as snow leopard festivals in those very remote um, uh, areas uh, in Tajikistan to, to bring back the knowledge that a, a snow leopard is a special uh, animal, that snow leopard uh, cannot be you know, hunted or killed, or even if it takes your livestock, uh, it is allowed to because of this divine status of, of this animal traditionally. And what we what we seen that in the past uh, year alone, um, we see uh, at least 
12, 12 cases where snow leopard would attack um, people, you know, farmers, um, animals, uh, sheep and goat, like kill everything. But instead of killing the snow leopard, uh, the local communities would uh, put put him in a cage and then drive it all the way uh, back into the high peaks of the mountain. Um, unfortunately, I do not have a video of this, but I'll be happy to share it, um, maybe in a separate uh, email or something. But this is a tremendous, tremendous success, and I don't think any um, kind of big, you know, uh, uh, or fancy conservation organization can 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 say that when it comes to for, of local community uh, involvement in, in in conservation of such um, a species. Um, what else? Uh, um, I mean, again, ha having those things interconnected, your traditional indigenous culture that have tremendous esteem for nature um, and animals, right, and 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 the environment, uh, and it's also which is part of your culture, and then it's part of your identity. So you can't just go out there and then you know pollute or um poach or because there will be severe consequences to everything you do so the revival of such knowledge those traditions it that's that's i i truly believe um and it is the answer to the the suppressing uh, conservation issues that that can be solved locally you know like um uh, uh, poaching uh, mine even mining and and so forth therefore uh, local people will be more proactive and uh, protest uh, uh, mining activities and then um then it will influence the policy makers and then there will be stricter policies in terms of natural uh, resources and 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 so forth i don't know and if that's good to mention again earth day message as you know maria uh, here in north america from Standing Rock to the Star Sands to British Columbia to Navajo Nation, the, there's the much of the most courageous pushback to the predatory practices of the fossil fuel industries have been coming from indigenous communities. And, um, and so that courage and that wisdom and that knowledge that goes back thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years and hundreds of generations is something is something that on a global basis is um, is profoundly altering the trajectory that we're on right now. Okay, back to you again. Yep. And if you um, if you're joining us, I I we we do want to eventually switch to um, questions from students in my class from the audience. But as you see, Maria's work is complex, and I think it's worth letting her show you the whole universe of what she's doing. Um, prior to questions, because that golden weave, I love that expression, by the way, Maria, even in an English translation, it's very beautiful, right? The golden weave between culture and human, human being as an animal and ecosystem survival and the other animals, the snow leopards, the Buryak cows, the eagles, um, and all, Lake Baikal, Mother Baikal herself, um, it's, it, is, it is all one weave. And so there's a real there's a real need to let Maria sort of show you the whole pattern so that your questions don't come um, in such a way that they're only looking at one strand and what is really a, a deeply interwoven and interconnected project for Maria herself, for her people, for the planet. Back to you, yeah, Maria. Yeah, thank you, Scott, and thank you. The, the, I, I'm sorry I didn't catch the, the person's name who asked the question, uh, but hopefully in the next slide, I believe there's a, a video, um, fairly short video, that highlights the work of the Lando Snow Leopard Network, and it will uh, probably explain you know, the reason behind the network and and how those things, again, are, are interconnected. So like when you say one aspect, we're actually saving many, many um, other things. So if you can, we, we can go to the next slide. And I'm almost done, by the way. So it's, it's I think it's, it's a natural transition to questions um, anyway. But if we can uh, play the video and hopefully everybody can hear too. Yeah, Chris, you have to share the sound too, right? Are you ready to do that before you play? Probably unmute. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a, he's, he's, he's got to hit a little button here for us. But I'm sharing to... the sound already. 
Okay, I don't know why it's not showing up. Hmm. Uh, what about what about the sound level on the right over there? That's Max. Do you have a YouTube link or something? I can try doing it through there. Oh, it's working. There it goes. Okay. 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 And I was a scientist, and I was a little skeptical about this. Um, but I have realized, working 30, 40 years in the field, that the local people really are the guardians of that habitat and that species. And unless we have them behind us, we are not going to succeed. For the members of the land of the snow leopard, what I really think is that you, they have a key role to play in snow leopard conservation. And the reason I say that is that they live out in the mountains. They see what is going on, whereas the wildlife department officials or the national park officials are in the office most of the time. And so their eyes and ears are not in the mountain. For LOSL, the eyes and the ears are in the mountain all the time. We, we very first met Norbulama in 2010, and Norbu explained to us that the snow leopard was a protector of their um, Soyot people. And this was the first time we had ever met people who had this spiritual connection to the, to the snow leopard. <laughs> связан с воспоминанием моего учителя. Перед самым уходом моего учителя мы вместе встретились с Нерном Барса. Вот после традиционного праздника почитания горы Мункос Редак, его хозяина Мункос Брынхана, после этого праздника вот мы ехали обратно и недалеко от этого места, где проходит сам молебен, На дорогу выскочил снежный барс. Это в ущелье Тымелик, где река Иркут протекает. В одном таком красивом месте, вот, где прыжим, скалы, плотную к дороге подходит. В этом месте вот, выскочил снежный барс на дорогу. Вот, здоровый самец. Вот таким образом у нас вот, стояла встреча с снежным барсом. Вот, это, в течение 30 минут, наверное, где-то мы наблюдали за ним. Ну, вот. На расстоянии где-то 40-50 метров, вот, буквально рядом. Он никак не испугался, стоял, позировал, буквально в смысле там. То есть, ну, вот. И я видел, как ну, учитель был погружен в некое состояние. Он молчал и смотрел, и вот какая-то связь вот, вот происходила вот, с этим, с Барсом. Ну и вот после всего он потихоньку начал подниматься в горы. Ну и вот пока вот хвостом не махнул там на самом гребне там и исчез там в горах. После этого учитель он сказал, что хозяева этих местностей вот, в знак того, что мы на правильном пути, он показал самое сокровенное, редкое, что есть в этих местах. В этом проекте по спасению снежного барса и горных экосистем вот, э, э, привлекает нас как культурных практиков. Это, э, по сути, инновационный подход именно в решении вот, именно 
защиты природы и вообще всего феномена жизни. То есть традиционные знания, они необходимы для человечества. То, что все-таки вот эта наша человеческая цивилизация, она многие вещи забывает, а коренные народы, они сохранили эти знания. Of the snow leopard mountain. It's actually called Ibis Two. Снежный барс там находится зимой и летом, и кругом он сейчас сейчас больше стал еще размножается еще снежный барс до сих пор есть. С этого снежного барса от природы мои предки жили связаны сами связаны были животными эти снежного барса. Они не допускали чужих людей туда, они не убивали козыроги, где он питается, ходит. Эти, вот эти мои родовые горы Ирбисту, мы до сих пор этих поклоняемся, поклон, низкий поклон. Я очень рада, что могу написать тебе письмо. Меня зовут Полина, и я учусь в третьем классе. Я очень люблю животных, и мне очень жалко их, так как среди нас людей много охотников и браконьеров, которые безжалостно убивают животных. И поэтому многие занесены в Красную книгу, и вы, Ирбисы, тоже. Дорогой Ирбис, я хочу извиниться за тех людей, которые не понимают, что наносят ущерб животному миру, а значит и всей природе. I just, I just, sorry, I hopefully can, everybody can see me now or hear me now. Um, there you are, yes. Yeah, there I am, okay. So um, as, as you can see, this video was, was done, um, was created by BBCAC um, uh, for the last year's uh, fundraising for the Land of Snow Leopard Network. Um, uh, um, so now they, they kind of, the, um, the technical support of the network is performed by Snow Leopard Conservancy, and they're based in Sonoma, California. So, uh, and we were invited to present um, at the fundraising event. Of course, we wanted uh, Norbu Lama uh, to be there personally, but as uh, there was an explanation, uh, it was uh, very difficult to, to get, get American visa at the moment. So, um, my my um, my team we were able to kind of co-present uh, on his behalf um 
I hope this video maybe partially answers some of the questions of how can animal uh, be so significant to, to, to um, a certain indigenous group. And um, it's only an introduction to the network, but it, I think it highlights the connection that is still present um, at, you know, uh, in, in indigenous uh, communities, especially with indigenous spiritual leaders, because we've learned about the Narbu Lama in the video, we learned about the shaman uh, from Altai, uh, Slava Chiltuyev, and he's the, um, her uh, he's a, a hereditary shaman, and he's also a sacred, gar uh, sacred site guardian. He's the guardian of the sacred the mountain Irbistu, and Irbistu literally translates as a snow leopard. So he's the protector of the Snow Leopard Mountain. Um, so it's important to um, support the, um, this uh, cultural and spiritual practitioner centers because they are the basis of, of um, you know, of indigenous um, communities. And um, um, what's next? Maybe next slide. And then we and can let me let me add as well, Maria, I'll put in a little, I mean, you were very eloquent at the beginning of the talk about how service learning at Foothill College became part of your life as a student and how that was transformative in terms of making friends and connecting with the campus. And of course, you were helping other people at the same time. But um, students and community members, if you, if you would like to help out the Snow Leopard Conservancy, as Maria just mentioned, is based in Sonoma, just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, we also have uh, mountain lion conservation organizations that, that would love your help here in North America as well. So it's one of the many, many ways that service learning can be quite transformative, um, even if it doesn't always lead directly to Cambridge University, which I'll let Maria pick up her own story at this point. Cambridge University in the United Kingdom, not Cambridge, Massachusetts. You seem to like places that have the word Cambridge in them, Maria. Yeah, I can't help it. Um, <laughs> so um, in 2017, I was admitted uh, to um, to learn at the Cambridge University at their ma um, Master's in Conservation Leadership program uh, within the Geography Department um, at, at, at Cambridge. Um, I, I don't know, I just put it out, out there because uh, just to, um, it was uh, as a part of my educational journey. Uh, but the thing what happened is that, um, of course it was um, on, on one hand, um, a lot of things were new and it was interesting. Um, uh, there were a lot of things I personally very disagreed with, uh, given that uh, the program was taught by the leading conservationists, Western conservationists um, today, but when it came to to uh, indigenous issues, there were practically no, uh, um, obviously no representation of that and no discussion of the importance of um, of, 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 of fighting or, or supporting indigenous groups. And because very often kind of like the old school, the traditional conservation uh, school of thoughts, which is practiced very widely today says that indigenous people were kind of like part of the problem that we should be kind of like um, moved away. For example, if it's, an, if it's a corridor, it's a elephant corridor somewhere in Africa and then a village happens to be next to it with, you know, with indigenous people. Let's move indigenous people away and make room for the elephants. But this particular thinking is very, very um, dangerous, not only, you know, from the human rights perspective, but also through the conservation perspective, because for thousands of years, you know, this, the people coexisted with the said uh, um, elephants and they formed a certain relationship, you know, with each other and the interconnection ha has happened. And when you break that down, just because, you know, WWF, let's say, said so, this leads to very, very um, um, tragic results, I would say. And I'm just, you know, obviously I'm kind of simplifying, but uh, that's that's what I've, um, that's the cases, unfortunately, uh, the, 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 the thoughts and the culture in the kind of uh, bigger um, 
conservation organizations today. I don't know, I was very outspoken about this, um, but nevertheless, it was an interesting, wonderful experience. I also made uh, lots of friends and, um, and uh, I was still working <laughs> at my organization uh, while going, but I was there uh, on campus all, all of, uh, throughout the whole time, of course, because you couldn't really leave and, and do it online. But, um, but I just couldn't leave because, you know, we, we, was, we were still, you know, working on our proposals and, and um, doing other stuff. <laughs> so it was very difficult to, to balance the kind of full, uh, the full time study and, um, and, 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 and my job, but that has to be done. And I'm glad that uh, that is over. <laughs> so, but very grateful for the experience, of course, nevertheless. And um, next slide, please. Okay, and I'll put in again, I'll put in my two cents, Maria, which is that uh, this, this is also a huge issue in North America as well. If you think about Yosemite, our most famous national park here in California, one of the world's most famous national parks, that was originally established by a military expedition that was sent to conquer and imprison the Awanichi people who had taken refuge in that, what is now the park. And so in Yosemite, in Lake Tahoe, which I write about a great deal, the, the Washoe people, their, their tribal homeland was Lake Tahoe, just as your tribal homeland was Lake Baikal. And the Washoe people presently have no tribal land rights whatsoever in their, in, anywhere on the shores of their own sacred lake. So this exclusion of indigenous people is not something that just happens, let's say in Russia or Mongolia, Tajikistan. This is something that's, that's an enormous and ongoing issue here in the United States and something really to be aware of. And Maria has always had this amazing ability to speak out even under difficult circumstances. So it's very Maria, I must say, that there in Cambridge, and of course, as you say, you learned a great deal, but I think they learned from you also. And there's a fundamental shift, I hope, going on now in the conservation community to listen to indigenous voices. You could hear it in the voice of that biologist in the film that you played for us, that he was initially quite skeptical, but learn deeply that the snow leopards will not survive if the indigenous culture doesn't survive and vice versa. Okay, back to you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So that kind of brings me to the end of my presentation today. I don't know, I just put up some references just in case. It's just a habit I picked up with both Foothill and Harvard, just reference everything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> reference everything. Yes, I have to make so many of you do work cited. Notice that Maria with her degree from Harvard and now from Cambridge is still doing <laughs> references and it matters when you're fighting these fights because people will tell you, you don't know what you're talking about. Where are your sources? What are you citing? And you, this is part of your armor as a scholar when you fight real battles. It's not just some annoying trick that we came up to make your life miserable and <laughs> in one see. This is part of your essential armor as a scholar. It is, it is absolutely essential. So Maria, of course, knows that because she's out there actually fighting these fights um, on behalf of her people, on behalf of the snow leopards, on behalf of the planet. Okay, and now I think we could probably start going to some questions. Sam, um, go ahead. Audience. Yeah, hi, my name is Sam, a uh, student in Scott's class. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah can you unblock your video Excellent. too? Oh, uh, yeah. that's okay. Uh, so m my question, uh, and this is something I've asked, um, you know, just different people who are either part of an indigenous group or advocating for indigenous groups is mm -hmm. it, that if you suddenly had sweeping international powers, what would you do now moving forward, you know, recognizing we can't change the past uh, to move mm -hmm. forward uh, to best position the Buryat in the world. If you look at the groups that are outside of the Republic, you look at, you know, the you know, we talked a lot about, you know, the land, you know, back in the Republic and, you know, I think can anticipate what a lot of the goals are there. But if you were to look at the culture and the people as a whole, what would you want to see? Mm. So <laughs> if, 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 if I understood correctly, you're asking my vision of the ideal future for indigenous people or for Buryat people? Yes, yes, for the Buryat yeah. people specifically. Yeah. 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 So, you know, um, the, the thing is that 
the, the probably one of the biggest challenges is that um, you know my people we are not recognized as indigenous people in Russia because Russia has their own definition um, of indigenous people and it's it's small numbered indigenous people and the population of of of, of Burnets it's 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 a little um, under uh, half a million. So, but on every other definition, you know, you took it, you, you look at the UN Declaration of Indigenous, you know, uh, people's rights and, and uh, internationally, there's, there's, there's no definition, but there is a set of recommendations or systems. Um, and first of all, it's, it's a self uh, identification. And, um, and, you know, then geographically, you know, you, you've been in this territory for, for, for so long, you know, pre-colonial or pre-annexation. And then you're culturally and um, um, and you know physically attached to, to to this particular land and landscape. Therefore, you are uh, indigenous. But the problem is that my people, in particular, we are not recognized as such, and um, we are denied the certain rights. Uh, for example, that other indigenous groups that are defined as indigenous in Russia um, have, you know, hunting. Um, fishing and etc so they have a little bit mo more rights on, on that um, but in the ideal world you know first of all we do have this recognition as, as indigenous people and as such we are able to to create um, um, uh, you know the, the territory of, 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 of traditional uh, you know pastoralism because as I said even though the, the cow project is very challenging. Um, there are people that are interested in kind of going back to the traditional um, roots. Um, and the, the other problem is that, as I said, the language is also disappearing um, because throughout the Soviet uh, uh, Union, um, the language was banned, basically. The culture was banned. The religious practices wow. was banned. And in, ideal, in my ideal vision is that um, Again, because everything is interconnected, you know, people go back to a um, traditional way as much as possible. But then you have the cow and then the bird language itself. I mean, it's so connected to, you know, to the, you know, domestic animals, to the wildlife, to, 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 to the surrounding ecosystem. And, and that's the, the, the forgotten words, the forgotten concepts, right, in both language wise and culture wise will be revived as well. So in my ideal vision, um, bring back pastoralism, um, um, thematic pastoralism, um, using the traditional methods and practices will revive all those other things. And that's where we live happily ever after. <laughs> yeah. I, and I, I can add, Maria, I know this about you, that Maria is working hard with other groups to, to hope to establish centers for the study of indigenous knowledge at various universities worldwide. And this is a, I mean, my class is about paradigm shifts, and this would be a major paradigm shift in institutions of higher learning worldwide. And there needs to be centers for the study of indigenous knowledge. Um, and Maria is one of the leaders in attempting to establish these things. The problem is that institutions remain largely tone deaf and blind to the depth of wisdom and the depth of knowledge, real, you know, real knowledge as defined as, as an academic, uh, conservation knowledge, cultural knowledge, ecological wisdom that's, that, that the indigenous peoples have preserved for centuries and centuries and centuries and, and really waiting to be asked essentially how to help because they know how to help. Um, and it's a question of getting universities to listen. So that's another very brave uh, battle that Maria is, is helping us to wage, uh, to get the universities to wake up and listen. And I, I lived through the centers for you know, centers for, for women's studies and centers for LGBTQ studies. And I've seen these revolutions happen before and I wanna see this happen. And, um, and Maria is one of the people making that happen. Now, I would also, oh. Sorry. Go ahead, I would just I would just also add one thing though that Sam asked is that you know it's not a zero sum game if indigenous people gain rights and privileges and recognition 
it, it doesn't have to come at the cost of any other group. I think it's just having a larger um, table, um, everybody oh, yeah. to be included. So I think the problem is we've we've looked at our policies and politics as a zero sum game that if one group gains something, then another has to lose. And I, I don't think that it has to be. So far. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, you're next, so go ahead and uh, unblock your camera and your um, audio. Hi. Hi, Maria. So I Hi, wanted to ask a question more about the different religious practice, um, practices that are taught in the culture, and I wanted to know if any of the Buddhist and maybe shamanism, correct me if I'm wrong on the pronunciation, um, practices are taught in the schools and in the camps, even if they are shorter, because I know how important um, these religious practices can be to, to preserving culture and to connecting with ancestors. So I wanted to know if they are threaded into the curriculum. Mm -hmm. in, in Specifically in, uh, at the Nomadic School of Creativity and, and the workshops, um, to be honest, we don't um, emphasize on the religious aspect yet, or or in, I don't think we should, um, because uh, m most of the kids, you know, even given their kind of urban background, um, they they still, you know, um, you know, either um, attempt uh, uh, attend temples, Buddhist temples with their families, or with their they. Um, with a under guidance or with the help of a shaman, they 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 um, with their families they they would undergo uh, shamanic ceremonies um, and so forth. So in in terms of this this this, this type of um, um, as like as aspect, we don't include it in 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 the curriculum yet. However, when we when we're working with the um, Snow Leopard project, uh, at the end of the video, you, you saw a girl reading, you know, a letter to Snow Leopard, apologizing on behalf of people. Yes. Um, we 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 have Norbu Lama, who's also in the video, the, the Buddhist monk, uh, guide us uh, through the schools. So he's opening, you know, the the lectures um, with 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 the. Uh, with uh, more of a um, uh, cultural and spiritual emphasis mm -hmm. of of snow leopard because you know he's the he's a divine uh, deity or spirit of of the Fayant mountains and and and, <clears throat> and such um, and then it's important to is, esteem the the snow leopard as 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 a sacred animal and you uh, the one who who lives near 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 it has this tremendous responsibility both spiritual and um and 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 cultural, uh, but in, uh, but but that does not. But the uh, I don't know uh, logistics wise, the this, this, the snow leopard um, work is not really related to the nomadic school of creativity work. Now, nomadic school of creativity is it, it's, it's about arts and 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 um, um, uh, like music. Uh, what else? Um, learning how to make traditional um, food. Um, I can put the picture uh, there, uh, how to assemble the yurt. However, um, there, there was another, um, I, I, I just, yeah, you, 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 you <laughs> yes, a very interesting question. Um, but uh, um, in, in terms of the thematic uh, school project, uh, there, there, there's not much emphasis on the like religious um, um, aspects of, of, of culture, but other aspects. Yes, thank you. I was really interested on um, just learning more about spirituality within the Buryat people, just because through the um, Center for Indigenous Culture site that we researched, it, there was a lot of indication that there was a lot of you know spiritual practices and connecting to the land and meditation. Yes, yes, and 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 we did so. It's just not through the uh, nomadic school of creativity. It would be through the snow leopard uh, project. It would be through the support of cultural and spiritual practitioners uh, through the uh, ceremonies. Um, mm -hmm. And and yeah. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jamie.
Chris or Juban, who do we have queued up next? For a Isha, go ahead. Hey, uh, hey Maria. Uh, thank you so much for speaking to us today. Um, so I basically had a question about the challenges that you might have faced, um, like some of the political and societal challenges that you faced when communicating the importance of, of preserving both the culture of the Buryat people and the environment. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I mean, there's, there's definitely a lot of challenges when it comes to speaking with um, either local officials, uh, authorities, you know, lo local governments, or whether it's uh, the government of the republic. I mean, they, they just don't get the importance of the cow, you know, let's say the, you know, the cow, because the thing is that the, the Buried cow. It, it of course it does produce you know dairy and and, and meat products, but it's it's um, volume wise it's smaller than the European breed, and therefore they would see oh you know this is a bad investment. But it's <laughs> it's it's such a very narrow type of thinking, um, and uh, I, I guess the biggest challenge that that would be you know with the with it would be the the, the cow project is just. Uh, um kind of very narrow mindedness of of the local government and um and again not 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 everybody is on, on the same page you know not all farmers are on the same page or they recognize the importance of having um this breed but there are farmers that recognize the importance of the breed and they want to be part of the movement it's just we don't have enough cows to redistribute to uh the people yet um in terms of other you know the kind of bigger challenges and just gonna be honest with you it's it's very difficult to receive um funding especially like foreign funding um in in, in russia if you're an ngo um there's a law that says you know uh, if you're kind of if you can't really justify um the reason why you know like let's say um and a foundation in America is sponsoring you, um, you can be labeled as a foreign agent and you can get into a lot of trouble. Um, but it's just, we found that, um, I mean, it's really difficult, but it's, 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 it's not that there are ways around it, but you just, you, you just take that risk and then you just, you know, you have your references, right? You have this as much of points of proof um, as possible. And then, yeah, that's that's and just kind of hope 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 for the best as for now. Um, another thing I would like to say is just that it's 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 not easy to work in. Let's say, um, and again, Russia does not really recognize our territory as being colonized. Um, it recognizes our territory is being voluntary, voluntarily annexed. It's like we voluntarily annexed ourselves to the Russian Empire, right? 350 plus years ago. Um, and it's very, it's, it's not easy to, and then we had um, 70 years of kind of Soviet re regime that suppresses, you know, your traditional culture, traditional knowledge, your language, your spirituality, your religion, then they, they take away your animals. And then it's just the change is not going to happen overnight in, in people's heads, right? Uh, there's this, this, and I make an argument for uh, intergenerational uh, trauma that is still present in all of us, not just buried people, but Russian people as well, because Russia's been through a lot in, in the 20th century alone. You know, you have your revolution, you have the, you know, World War One, the revolution, then the uh, Stalinist repressions, like millions, like tens, like millions of people who've been killed or put to prison when Stalin was in power. And then we have World War Two, when like over, what, 20 million, um, uh, Soviet uh, soldiers uh, died, so it's like a lot of people died, and then we had a severe transition from Soviet Union to Russia, Russian Federation, like kind of semi-democratic, semi-capitalistic state, and still like a lot of challenges with that too. So it's just at the end of the day, it's just, uh, I think it's about people not 
being healed yet, you know, in, in Russia as a society. And I think that's that's the biggest challenge. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and let me break in and say, Maria, um, I know it's getting past, it must be about two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning there. Um, I kind of been leaving it up to each of our speakers how many questions they take. Um, we could do one more um, and wrap then, or if you wanna keep going. So I'm gonna keep asking you as we kind of go along. Students, I know that some of you have other classes and other obligations, so you're not obligated to stay with us, but um, we can we can go long if if Maria doesn't fall asleep um, on the other side <laughs> of the planet in the in the cold in the darkness of Siberia at two o'clock in the morning. Um, Maria, how are you feeling? You want to do one more question, or you want to do uh, a few more questions? What's your uh, feeling? I, I, I mean, as, as many questions as 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 as, um, as people. As as as, um, <laughs> as colleagues would, would would like, and again, but being mindful of of their own time, because yeah. they of course it's it, people. So have again, officially officially we're kind of wrapping up, but unofficially we're going to keep going with some questions. So if you'd yeah. like to stick with us, that's great. Um, let's see if we can get a few more questions going. Saba, go ahead. Yes, yeah, Saba's next. Hi. Um, so it's really evident from reading your articles and just from other things that I've read that indigenous peoples across cultures are very connected to mother nature and they're very connected to the land around them just because of how long they've been around and how long they've had to live in the areas that they are living, they are living in. So my question is, what do you think <coughs> the world can learn from indigenous people about respecting mother nature and respecting the world around them? Hmm. Yeah, thank you, Saba. I think the essence, it just goes down to that. Um, it's, first of all, we're, we're not the kings of nature, <laughs> right? We're not the, the, the top of the pyramid. Uh, we are part of nature. And that's a very simple understanding. And yet it's, it's a very complex one, especially for, for, you know, for, for, for a world who, who's so reliant on the exploitation of, 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 of nature. And I think uh, perhaps maybe this pandemic will teach a thing or two <laughs> about the importance of, about um, the thing that interconnectedness does exist and it's not just, you know, a fancy word and how little things are overlooked and that we can't continue to exploit nature because that's, you know, we can't continue to exploit wildlife and just, um, and just be mindful. And I think it will teach the importance of, um, um, on how to, I don't know, what, 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 what really matters, right? Uh, because families are locked inside and then, you know, for better or for worse, but people are rediscovering themselves. And they recognized, you know, maybe my, you know, my uh, to just to 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 question their their day to day activities. Maybe we should not consume as much. Maybe we don't need that much. Maybe at the end of the day, we just need so little. And I think maybe now it's an opportunity that this shift m may happen. Yeah, I'm very hopeful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Rachel, you're next. Um, hi. Um, one thing I want to say is that because your work is very extensive and very complicated, mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if, like, if you can sum up and condense everything. What, what, what is the one thing that you would tell someone that who has no idea about indigenous people, so they can have like more respect for the indigenous group? Thank you. Oh yeah, thank thank you, Rachel. Um, I think it's it's just so important to um, I mean, wherever you you are, like I recognize that there are countries that are more, um, let's say that don't necessarily have indigenous groups or 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 you know or don't want to recognize as such, but I think. For example, everyone knows that the troubles 
in Amazon, in Amazon rainforest, right? And once you start exposing yourself to um, at least uh, on conservation issues, and uh, luckily or not luckily, but um, what I've noticed is through the past several years, there have been more um, articles, more um, uh, media exposure on indigenous people and conservation and how indigenous people are frontliners. So standing rock, for example, um, or indigenous people's fights for Amazon rainforest to defend Amazon rainforest or the fires in Australia, which happened largely because of the the, of the of the um, loss of um, the traditional Aboriginal practices of you know the the, the, the controlling of, of fires. So I think you know if if you if one cannot or not interested in in indigenous issues, one has to be interested by now um, in conservation uh, issues, or at least because it's you know you scroll down on Facebook, there should be at least one or two article on on the on conservation issues somewhere in the world and then you click the link and then you read more and then and so forth and so forth and kind of go, gets you down to the rabbit hole or, or i don't know how to phrase this but but it, but again everything is very interconnected and you touch one subject but it relates to so many more subjects so maybe start with conservation Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. Pablo, you're next. Hello. Um, so as someone from Tatarstan in Russia, um, learning Tatar language and culture was sort of forced upon us in a way. Mm -hmm. And um, most people really kind of left, most kids were left ignorant of that because we were tested and it was like a five day a week thing. And um, I was interested, how do you keep the, the culture learning process for the kids interesting and engaging rather than what happened to us where we were mandatorily, you know, thrown into something that we didn't even understand. And now I find myself not knowing anything about it. Thank mm. you. Yeah, thank you, Pavel. In, in, in regards to um, language, we, we, we don't emphasize it yet um, in, in our camps and workshops. But the thing is, is that in our approach within our methodologies, we we bring kids as again we, we treat them like adults. Basically, <laughs> that's the secret. You treat them like an adult. You put them into decision making processes, you know. And in the camp, I mean, they themselves they had to assemble the yurt, and they, you know, that's and that's a fantastic team building exercise, I think. <laughs> And so they learned how to assemble the yurt and learned how, how each part is called and each part is called in, in the Brit or Mongolian language. So they assembled the yurt, then they, they're, they're, um, they're talking to the elders and the elders can, you know, talk in Russian. Um, and then it's just make it as, as fun as, 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 as possible. Like they, 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 it's very interactive, so they, everything is done by, by their own hands, you know, whether it's the yurts or the traditional foods, you know, the traditional dumplings and traditional big uh, pastry. And then uh, the fact that they're traveling, you know, from one country to another, uh, as, as the, the, the camp of, of, of previous year, I mean, the, the, the road trip is always fun, right? It's such a journey. And then they came to Mongolia and stayed in another camp with lots of other children, Mongolian children, but then they would have this um, kind of um, private uh, classes with the, with the uh, Mongolian artists and so forth. So it's just, um, yeah, it's just, you know, you, you, you treat a child like uh, he's an adult and then you involve the child in the, in the conversation as their opinion of why it matters, um, we also have a small film about that that, that the camp, and um, so uh, maybe you can uh, set, uh, send the link later. Um, in terms of language, I, I, I kind of get what you're saying of, of it being perceived as boring in, in schools. In Buryatia, unfortunately, there was, um, even though the Buryat language is an official language in, in Buryat Republic, 
it is taught in schools, but only maybe two times a week. And it's been a battle just to get it to that level. Um, and even if, it, if it's taught, it's like an elective course and nobody has time for that. So it's just, you, the situation is much, much worse. But now we see a lot of parents who are interested in, in teaching, you know, the language, the, the, the culture to their children because they recognize, because, you know, the, 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 the language of the culture, you, you, your big piece of your identity is, is missing. And it's important to create new methodologies of, of teaching um, those uh, threatened indigenous languages to, to, uh, to, to children. And we're lacking such um, methodologies as of now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, Jamie is next. Jamie, are you still there? Hi. All right, so I'm just looking for my question, see if I still want to answer that. Ask that one again. Okay, so I wanted to know actually more about the UN conference where you talked about the um, sensitive and controversial topics, you know, and just how an honor it was to be there and what it took to be able to speak there and what you talked about at that conference. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Um, this was a, so UN hosts um, annually, you know, each every year, um, Indigenous Peoples um, Forum, uh, where Indigenous people all over the world, they, they come to the UN and speak about their issues. And every year there's a theme, let's say the, the theme is endangered Indigenous languages, or the theme is, you know, something else, or, um, um, I, to be honest, I'm so sorry, I forgot the theme of, <laughs> of, the course, okay. of, the, of that specific, uh, but, but uh, nevertheless, we, we, we talked about the uh, revival of Aboriginal breed cow, um, mm. both my colleague um, and, and, and I, and the importance of, um, you know, reintroducing it back to the breed landscape. I basically said the exact same thing I, I said to you <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> For, uh, about the cows, yeah. Okay, and was there any like opposition to um, the Bra people having possession of the Aboriginal cows? Because before, like you're talking a little bit about like the mainstream type of cows, mm -hmm. and like was there any opposition to having true like Aboriginal cows? Um, I wouldn't say like opposition, but at the same time, when you don't have support from, you know, Ministry of Agriculture that is supposed to be kind of um, stepping in, um, in, in both of um, giving you financial resources, you know, or mm. to, to, to conduct more research, because of course more, more, more research needs to be done. Um, that is an obstacle uh, itself. And, and the thing is with the, I don't want to, go way into the politics, but the politics in, in Russia, within regions in Russia is as such, you can't, they can't really do anything without permission of Moscow, okay. the, Kremlin, the Kremlin. And if Kremlin says it's okay, then it's okay. But the thing is, Russia is so big, so by yeah. the time Kremlin says something, it's already like half a year. <laughs> mm -hmm. Passes or something, or a couple of years passes and, and, and so forth. So it's very difficult. I mean, I kind of get where they're coming from because that's how the 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 the, 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 the political system is set. But at the same time, it's just if they're being a little bit more proactive and lobby like the the cow, for example, at Kremlin, the the process would go faster. I but see. again, they're as I said, they're a little narrow uh, minded. Which have, we, but you know, but that's that's the reality. Yeah. That reminds me of Sam's I'll, question. I'll throw in my my quick geographic fact. Um, when I was in Ulan Ude with Maria, I was continually astonished to remind myself that the distance between where Maria is sitting now in Ulan Ude and Moscow is further than the distance from Moscow to New York, and the this, the the sort of vastness of the Russian state is almost incomprehensible and that that's the fact that brings it home and of course she's not in the 
easternmost regions of Siberia at all. So, so if it's further from her to Moscow than New York to Moscow, you get an idea of how, how vast a region um, you have to communicate across. And now let's take more questions. Thank you. And parse us next. Yeah, so um, in the one article I read about the Buryat people, I learned that um, bright colors were a big part of their culture. Um, so what do they represent and symbolize? Because uh, that mm -hmm. hasn't touched yet. Oh, yeah, very interesting. Um, <laughs> um, it's a very interesting observation. I haven't really thought much about ab about it, but we have to uh, tie this to the fact to when Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, came to Buryatia in 18th century, and it came from Mongolia. Um, so a lot of the color concepts came from Tibetan Buddhist traditions, such as five colors, blue, white, uh, green, um, yellow, and red. Uh, so, for example, um, we have this tradition of offering khadak, and khadak is like a ceremonial scarf, and it's given to the most esteemed people. For example, a blue one is, is, is the most classical version, so you give it to, um, like, let's say Scott comes again, next year or something like at the airport i'm going to stand with the blue hadak right the, the, the symbol of of um um of 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 uh, of welcoming um and and uh but if it was for example um some someone um more older or somebody with more so somebody's like Somebody who who deserves more esteem that that the scar doesn't. Oh, I'm making bad analogies, <laughs> but um, but the white scarf would be like oh my gosh, like the 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 the, the, the top of, of <laughs> the, the the top color. Um, like the yellow scarf would be offered to um, Buddhist uh, monks, and then as for red and green, I think it's offered during a specific religious Buddhist ceremonies. Um, in terms of clothes, uh, again, it's it's it may be colorful, like 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 Scott uh, said, like it looked like a crimson color. I've never thought about it, but it's just this type of silk comes from China, and I don't know whatever they bring to you, you 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 buy and then you sew so <laughs> sew the the clothes um, in, in in traditional uh, way, and it's just so it. it then it's colorful. <laughs> Maybe that, that's an explanation. Sorry if I didn't answer. Oh, you did. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, are you still feeling like you can go on? I know we're, we're past the top of the hour, five minutes. So I'm just giving you another chance mm -hmm. to decide that, that you need some sleep. But we, we, um, otherwise, we can keep going. How are you doing? Yeah, maybe like 15 more minutes and 15 okay. more minutes. So yeah. generous, Mr. your time. Thank you. It's the middle of the middle of the night. Thank you very much. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? Um, so I have a question. Um, oh, Jobin, do you want to go ahead? Oh, okay. Uh, I think like a lot of indigenous people don't really get represented in like the mainstream media. Like for example, um, I think uh, just regarding the topic of climate change, there's like uh, Greta Thunberg as well as this 19 year old a Brazilian climate activist that rarely got discussed outside of like a few programs like Democracy Now. Uh, how do you think you can bring like indigenous people's culture to the mainstream media? And why do you think a lot of these news outlets and media sources don't necessarily represent indigenous people as much as they should? Mm -hmm. um, it's a very interesting question. Um, well, for starters, it will depend. Well, first of all, of course, I cannot really speak for all indigenous people. <laughs> Only for for, for just the Buryat, okay? Yeah, Buryat context. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, there's probably a couple of things. Um, one is maybe a certain tribe, let's say even with Buryat or a certain clan, would would not even like to be exposed you know, in, in mainstream media. So that has to be, of course, you know, respected. Um, second is that um, 
uh, Greta Thunberg, she actually used her platform. She was in one very fancy climate meeting. I forgot which one. And of course, all journalists gathered, but she gave, and she also brought um, indigenous youth activists on, on the stage. So instead of her talking, those guys were talking, the you know, indigenous youth activists. So I thought it was really, really cool. Um, it, was so the UN, it was at the UN, it was at the UN climate talk um, last yeah. September. It was the same one that they made a meme of her when she was hissing at Donald Trump. Oh, <laughs> so I guess it's the very legendary meeting then. Um, so we, if we can have, you know, the, 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 I mean, the situation is improving. I think, uh, again, especially with the, uh, with internet and social media, there's a bit more uh, exposure, but again, only if you're subscribed to certain um, um, news or, or groups and so forth and things go viral much much faster than anything else in history um it's just probably again i i when you think about this uh not a lot of uh truly important topics go out there in the media to begin with that's the question of how to change in media you know media and and, and, and news sources but it's very difficult and I don't really have an answer for that. Um, but I guess my recommendation is, is that uh, for indigenous groups, at least in my um, region, is to be proactive in social media and, not on, um, and also um, use other languages. Maybe we should write more in English, like really. Uh, um, and maybe we should um make more uh, emphasize more on the digital story making and and also publish it in different languages and maybe that's that's how we'll, we'll get that um representation uh and maybe not wait until somebody does it for you like like thank you greta of course but we can't really wait until next you know celebrity uh gives us a platform which we have to take it ourselves and it's very difficult to do it through traditional media. So that's why perhaps digital media and internet would be our, the, the, the solutions to this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Do we have I any questions? We're, we're down to just about eight people now. So I think we, yeah. <laughs> one, if there's one more question, we could take it, or that's not a bad place to wrap either. So is anybody, feeling like they want to unmute themselves and ask one more question, or shall we let Maria get some sleep finally? Let's see if anybody's popping in. Okay, well, I'm gonna, I think I'll go ahead and wrap it up for us. Um, again, thank those of you that, that lingered longer. This is what happens in a real, in a, in a real room. Um, Maria was in the Hearthside Room on Foothill College campus last November as we were remembering together. Um, and that's, and it's been, it's kind of, that was amazing. It was amazing to have you there physically, but this is fair, this is also a kind of miracle to have you coming literally from Ulan Ude um, in the middle of the night in the Siberian spring. Um, so thank you for being with us. Um, I'm gonna remind the audience that will watch this um, asynchronously because we will be posting all the recordings, but um, I'm gonna remind the audience that the, um, that the API Heritage Month schedule is on foothill.edu and we have API resource links. We will also have links to all of the archive videos and if you scroll down in this page then you will also find all the other um, all the other uh, authors and speakers that are coming to us in the remainder of April. So please join us for that. Next week we'll have Viola Lesmana, another Foothill uh, graduate who's a professor at USC for example. And Andrew Land joining us next week for um, the 45th anniversary of the fall of Saigon from Ho Chi Minh City. So thank you very much, Maria, for being here. And we'll go thank ahead you, and you. end the meeting and wave goodbye to you and let you get some sleep. And we will look forward to hosting you in person again after the quarantine. And, <laughs> um, and thank you so much for being a part of our lives and part of our school and for all the kind words for Foothill College that you've said. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Scott. Thank you, Chris. And um, I'm sorry, J Jubin, uh, if I mispronounce your, your name. Um, thank you so much for, for supporting uh, my, my talk today and um, to, all of, to all of the um, students, audience that, uh, um, that, that, that have listened today. Thank you so much and uh, stay well. Thank you again for coming. Stay, 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 thank, stay. You. thank you. Yeah, thank you. And have a, have a great day. How do we contact you if we have any more questions about oh, your sure. project? Um, just, just through my email. Uh, let me put this in the chat. And of course, Scott has it as well. Yeah. I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions.